So uh, hello everybody and uh, welcome to uh, individual papers in pre-modern uh, literature 5, uh, lit pre-22. Uh, so I have the great pleasure of welcoming the two other speakers uh, today. Uh, firstly, Frederick Fielden of the University of Cambridge will present Relighting the Peony Lantern, Strategies of Adaptation in Santo Kyoden's Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro. Uh, after this, Frank Chu of the University of Edinburgh will present the powers controlling the voice over the incomplete death, yure, throughout Tokugawa Japan. Um, also, given the constraints of time, uh, we are going to hear the three presentations first, one after another, and uh, regroup all the audience questions for the end of the session. Uh, hopefully, this should make for a good, uh, interesting discussion at the end. Uh, so I'll be accepting questions by Zoom chat or um, people raising their hands at the end, so uh, either is okay. Uh, if you use Zoom uh, chat for your question, remember to, please remember to, um, uh, to mention the name of the speaker. Uh, so to avoid confusion uh, today, we'll be, uh, presented, we'll be following the present presentation order listed on the portal site. Um, so I would like to start uh, with my presentation. So I'll just do the screen share. Okay, so um, my uh, presentation today is on the rediscovery of the poems of the playwright uh, Namiki Sosuke. Let's try and minimize this, okay. So hello everybody. Um, today I would like to talk about the important uh, 18th century playwright Namiki Sosuke and the significance of a handful of his poems which were that were rediscovered during the 20th century. The playwright Namiki Sosuke was born in 1695 and died in Osaka in 1751 in the middle of the Japanese Edo period. In the latter part of his career, he wrote under the name Namiki Senryu. Although his name is not widely known in Japan today, Sosuke is considered by experts in the field as one of the most important playwrights of the Edo period. He wrote or led the co-writing of some 40 plays for the Osaka Puppet Theater, known as Ningyo Joriri, and his writing is surely one of the principal reasons for the appearance of the golden age of the Osaka Puppet Theater in the 1740s. His plays are still performed in its modern successor, the Bunraku Theater. And as is, as is the case in other world puppetry traditions were intended for adult audiences rather than children. Adaptations of plays written under his supervision are also very commonly performed in Kabuki. Sosuke was most likely the leading creative force behind the group of three plays known as the three masterpieces of the puppet theater, which were written in successive years. These are Sugawara and the Secrets of Calligraphy, 1746, Yoshitsune and the Thousand Cherry Trees, which premiered in 1747, and Chushingura, the Treasury of Loyal Retainers uh, of 1748. This last play in particular established itself as the classic version of the 47 samurai, uh, 47 Ronin incident. In modern times, Chushingura has also been the most commonly performed play in the Kabuki repertoire. Today, after a brief overview of Sosuke's life and the characteristics of his very individual writing style, I shall examine a number of poems written by this playwright that enhance our understanding of his life and dramatic works. Then to conclude, I shall examine the question of how Sosuke's early poetry deepens our appreciation of his later dramatic work, and more largely informs us about the Ningyo Jorari theater and the milieu in which it was created. So what do we know about Sosuke's life? Unfortunately, much of his biography is elusive. 
born in 1695, Sulski's birthplace and childhood home remain uncertain, but it was possibly the city of Osaka where he would live from the age of 32. His social class at birth is also unknown, but the career he followed as a monk, as well as the stylistic details of his works, suggest that he received a good education, which enabled him to read extensively. His childhood and adolescence coincided with the end of Genroku culture, the heyday of popular culture in the Kyoto Osaka region. He became a monk at the age of 19 at a Zen temple of the Rinzai sect in Mihara in modern Hiroshima prefecture. While Japanese Zen Buddhism reached its zenith during medieval times, during the Edo period, its role at the forefront of education was gradually taken over by secular Neo-Confucian organizations, and the temple system came to serve as a kind of semi-official organ of control for the Tokugawa regime. However, the Zen sects produced many of the most influential Buddhist thinkers and popularizers of the Edo period. Most famous, perhaps, is the distinguished monk uh, Hakuin Ekaku, who was Sosuke's near contemporary. As an accomplished author, painter, and calligrapher, he posed his followers metaphysically difficult enigmas called koan, developing perhaps the most famous of these today, the famous riddle of the sound of one hand clapping. The mental fatigue engendered in attempting to resolve the enigma was thought to favor sudden enlightenment. Both Hakuin and Sosuke moved in the same circles at the same time, but it is not known whether they met. We shall later touch on the intriguing possibility of the influence of the Koan enigma on Sosuke's dramatic work. Around the age of 30, Sosuke left the monastic life to return to secular life in Osaka, marrying into a wealthy merchant family. Around this time, Sosuke converted to the Nichiren sect, which was that of his new family, but also had many devotees within the artistic professions. Sosuke took to writing plays at this time, no doubt putting to work the literary skills that he had developed as a Zen monk. His playwriting career can be divided into two main parts. During the first part, from 1726 to 1742, he wrote 29 works for the relatively young Toyotakisa Theatre, founded in the Osaka Dotonbori district in 1703. His distinctive works from this period, somber, unsentimental, and brilliantly dramatic, quickly disappeared from the Osaka stage and are largely absent from today's Bunraku repertoire. Plays at the time were longer than those in the earlier period of Chikamatsu, and thus a division of labor had established itself in the form of a system of collective writing. However, the role of the lead writer, which Sosuke almost always took on, was a crucial one, as he conceived the main plot elements and himself wrote the most dramatic scenes of the play. The lead writer allotted less important scenes to other members of his writing team before unifying the various texts in a whole. In this way, the lead writer of a hit play could ordinarily expect a large portion of the credit for its success. After leaving his first theater and joining the illustrious Takemotoza further along the same street at the dawn of the golden age, he was protected by the great author Takeda Izumo I, known for his nurturing of talented playwrights. And it is here that Sosuke conceived his most famous works, including the three masterpieces mentioned earlier. It looked as though Sosuke's talent would at last lead to wider recognition. However, by a sort of cruel irony, uh, equal to that so often portrayed in his works, Sosuke never won the public recognition that seemed to be his due. After the death of Takeda Izumo I in 1746, 
Ismore's son took on the management of the illustrious theater. Research by Uchiyama Mikiko, the foremost scholar of Namiki Sosuke, strongly suggests that Izumo II uh, appropriated Sosuke's work as his own. It is at this moment that we find hidden in his text a claim of authorship of the work, a claim to his authorship of the work. We can interpret this cryptic reference as a kind of exasperated sigh on the part of Sosuke before the erasure of his contribution to Japanese theater. What arrests the reader of Sosuke's works today is his highly individual style, often described as pessimistic or fatalistic, which is most strongly evident in his early works, but still present in the later ones. As elements of his style, we can firstly mention the meticulous structure of these plays, which enables him to use novel techniques such as foreshadowing or fukusen. Using this technique, Sosuke casually introduces characters and plot elements whose true significance will be understood by the audience only in a later scene of the play. We can also mention Sosuke's development of the enigma technique or nazotoki. At a certain point, the characters of his most tragic scenes come into contact with a symbolic object, such as a cherry tree, helmet, or garment. These beautiful items are actually clues signifying an impending tragedy, and the characters, at the same time as the audience, come to a startling realization of the situation in which they are implicated. Given Sosuke's background, one may wonder whether he was aiming to elicit an aesthetic response from the theater audience, similar to the spiritual response elicited by the Koan's resolution in the Zen temple. Answering this point satisfactorily would require further study of the Zen sects and their spiritual practices, but the question remains an intriguing one. The Enigma te technique is one element of the tumbling descent towards tragedy, which distinguishes Sosuke's most tragic scenes. These scenes often open in a, in a festive or convivial atmosphere, but at some point, as I mentioned, there appear portents that suggest a tragic turn of events. The character's gradual understanding that a crisis is imminent and that their hopes and plans are ultimately futile, crushed by greater forces, contributes to the somber, dramatic effectiveness of the scene and enables the emergence of a very new kind of tragic hero or heroine. The rediscovery of Namiki Sosuke in the post-war period owes much to two 20th century discoveries. First, that of a memorial steel containing uh, Sosuke's farewell poem in the 1940s. And secondly, that of three Chinese poems written by Sosuke during his youthful period as a Zen monk. The three Chinese poems, composed on the occasion of an autumn journey to the west of Honshu and the island of Kyushu in 1723 at the age of 29, describe his encounter with a powerful earthquake on the road, as well as his visit to Dan no Ura, site of the final defeat of the Heike clan. The subject that, subjects that Sosuke evokes in these poems foreshadow themes that will pervade Sosuke's entire dramatic oeuvre. Since the foundations of the first Japanese Zen monasteries in the Kamakura period by monks with experience of living in China, the composition of Chinese poetry played an essential role in building courteous and, and cordial relations relationships among the monastic community. And the poems of the so-called Five Mountains temples in particular are well known today. It was undoubtedly during his period as a Zen monk that Sosuke mastered the technique of composing Chinese verse. And the three short poems that appear in the Mihara anthology under his pen name Danke were written towards the end of this period. Two of the three poems, one a quatrain or zeku, the other an octave or dishi, describe the strong earthquake he encountered. 
The first quatrain deals with the, the phenomenon from a traveler's point of view. The effect of feeling the earth quaking underfoot, the sight of travelers now crawling on the ground, the earthquake's roar that seems to last for eternity. This description is followed by a remark that one doubts whether the earth is still turning on its axis. The octave, on the other hand, reflects the contrast between the cyclical and eternal nature, eternal character of nature, the autumn leaves, the sun and the moon, and the, and the chaos caused by the temporary earthquake, manifested in natural elements such as the rivers and mountains. In this way, Sorsky shows tremendous talent in turning a single lived experience into two accomplished poems. Composing classical Chinese poetry, or Qin Tai Shi, requires adherence to extremely strict metrical conventions and a mastery not only of the pronunciation of the final rhymes, but also of the tonal category of each and every syllable of the poem. For the Japanese people of the time, it was a discipline even more difficult to acquire than the composition of classical Japanese poetry. Sosuke shows a perfect mastery of the poetic conventions when composing these poems and goes so far as to integrate a form of rhyme borrowed from the archaic Chinese verse or koshi. The use of this rhyme, which clashes with the harmonious sonority characteristic of the elegant form, contributes to reinforcing the poem's theme. The shock of a sudden dislocation from everyday life during a violent earthquake. It is highly likely that Sorsky produced a larger body of poetry than what is known today. The remaining poem, the second quatrain, describes a visit to the historic site of Danoura, located on the Kanmon Strait, separating the islands of Honshu and Kyushu. The author contemplates the scene of the naval battle where the once dominant Taira clan was annihilated in the spring of 1185. He imagines the location of the ancient battle in the distance, with the cold winds of autumn reinforcing the feeling of desolation. But this contemplation of the real gives way to a sort of optical illusion according to which natural phenomena are assimilated to the visual elements of the battle that took place there 500 years previously. Are the autumn leaves not indeed battle flags, the bare trees spears? Let us now turn to Sosuke's farewell poem, or Jise in Japanese. This was engraved on his longevity steel, or Juhi, which he erected at a Nichiren temple in Osaka in 1736 at the age of 42. The poem explicitly refers to Sosuke's taking Buddhist orders at the age of 19, which corresponds to other biographical sources. The burning house, or kataku, which he mentions, is an, all an allusion to the parable of the three cards and the burning house in the third chapter of the Lotus Sutra, or Hokekyo. The parable in question expounds the importance of expedience, that is to say the gradual rather than full revelation of the Buddha's teachings. But the terrible urgency conjured by the image of the burning house and the children escaping from it made it a widely known reference point in pre-modern Japan. Sosuke's poem thus not only confirms his conversion from Zen Buddhism to the Nichiren sect, where the Lotus Sutra was central, but also intriguingly suggests a traumatic event in the writer's adolescence an event so disruptive that it pushed him to follow the path of leaving the laity and becoming a Zen monk. The nature of this event is not known at present, perhaps it may never be, but it remains an intriguing biographical mystery. How then can we relate the material of his early poems to the later work for the theater? Thematically, the theater researcher Suaharuo has linked the existentialist quality of Sorsky's work and his particular vision of humanity 
to his experience as a Zen monk, but considers that the pessimism and fatalism infusing his plays is unique to Sosuke. Stylistically, another theater researcher, Kawaguchi Setsuko, has noted the influence on Sosuke's work of the syntax of Chinese forms, such as parallel prose. This can be detected in Sosuke's frequent use of ellipsis and syntactic inversion of words. These two theses open valuable avenues of reflection for future studies on Sosuke's style. Here, however, I wish to suggest that his Chinese poems may be seen as a form of artistic manifesto, which his prolific later dramatic production would develop in astonishing diversity. Firstly, his visit to the battle site of Dan Moura suggests his deep affinity for the epic tale of the Heike, Heike Monogatari, and especially for the tragic fall of the Taira clan, which was annihilated at this site. Sosuke was perhaps the playwright of his generation who was most familiar with the details of this epic work, and he would return to reimagine the material in several of his greatest plays. Secondly, his earthquake poems suggest his fascination for the precise moment when everyday life transforms into catastrophe, and this sudden change of mood can be experienced by the audience in his most tragic scenes. An example of such a fatal moment, accompanied by the bitter irony characteristic of Sosuke, occurs in the scene, the sushi shop, Sushiya, in Yoshitsune, and the thousand cherry trees. Crooked Gonta, a swindler and ne'er-do-well, experiences a sudden change of heart and heroically decides to sacrifice his own wife and son to save the lives of a noble Taira family in exile. However, his plan backfires. He is misunderstood and fatally wounded by his own father, surviving just long enough to overhear that his sacrifice was in vain as the noble family enjoyed secret protection from the shogun himself. Thirdly, uh, we come to the third, thirdly, we can mention his interest in the boundaries between events past and present, which at some point in his history plays proves to be blurred. As an example of this tendency, we can cite another scene from the same play, the Tokaya Transport Company or Tokaya. Here, a transport company owner, Tokaya Gimpe, ostensibly a member of the 18th century merchant class, is later revealed to be the general Taira no Tomomori, previously thought dead in battle. After his true identity is revealed, he throws himself into the sea weighted with an anchor, a motif that recalls his drowning, according to the historical facts, at the Battle of Dan no Ura. The epic past, which loomed in the imagination of the audience, is thus transposed onto the contemporary reality which surrounded them. Sosuke's entire dramatic production, through to his last play, uh, Puzzle Chronicle of the Two Young Leaves at Ichinotani, can thus be thought, but can thus be seen as a quest for the ideal representation of the literary, of the youthful literary concerns found in his early Chinese poems. Consideration of Sosuke's individual background as a Zen monk, in a similar way to some other Jordani playwrights of the period, also leads one to ponder the significance of Ningyo Jordani more widely. As a brilliant creation of the Osaka Commercial Theater District, there is a tendency to view this puppet theater as a pure innovation of the townsman or Chonin class. However, the urban culture that produced Jordani was by no means a monoculture. Rather, it was the confluence of a number of intellectual influences. Its most revered author, Chikamatsu Monzaenon, was himself from the samurai class, serving in aristocratic houses in his youth. And many of the commentators of the theater were from the Confucianist class of educators and thinkers. Jordani was a theatrical form which flourished in Osaka in, uh, which flourished in Osaka as a result of the intellectual vigor 
and social diversity of the Osaka society of the time. And its greatest works lead the viewer to contemplate their significance long after the performance is over. To conclude, Namiki Sosuke's dramatic project can be seen as an attempt to adapt for the theater of his time, uh, the themes of his early poems in Chinese, with a constant striving towards greater dramatic perfection. His plays continue to captivate theater goers and readers of his works and to provide nourishment for reflection. It is to be hoped that it is to be hoped that the increasing number of academic studies of Namiki Sosuke's oeuvre will ultimately lead to a deeper appreciation of his many masterpieces, both in Japan and overseas. Uh, thank you for listening today. So I'll stop the screen share now. Okay, so um, thank you for listening, everybody. So uh, next, um, that's right. So now I have the great pleasure of welcoming Frederick Fielden of the University of Cambridge, who will present uh, Relighting the Peony Lantern, Strategies of Adaptation in Santo Kyoden's Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro. So over to you, uh, Freddie. There we go. Is that all? Nice. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Jonathan, so much for that kind introduction. Um, I've just completed the first year of my PhD under the supervision of Dr. Lara Moretti and I'm researching the development of 19th century kusazoshi, and in particular, gorkan, a genre of graphic narrative in which text and image are intertwined on almost every page. Today, I'd like to present the case study at the heart of the first chapter of my thesis, Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro, a Gorkan in two volumes published in 1810 with the dream team of author Santo Kyoden and illustrator Utagawa Kunisada. The focus of this presentation is the strategies Kyoden used to adapt the Peony Lantern, a story of supernatural seduction hailing from Ming China, in which a man encounters a mysterious and beautiful woman accompanied by a young maid with the eponymous lantern, as an affair, and discovers she is in fact a skeleton, only then to succumb to her charms and ultimately come to a grisly end. To begin with, I'll briefly summarize the limited scholarship to date and propose my own theoretical position before turning to a three-part analysis of this book. This involves firstly, considering the paratextual promise Kjordan makes to his readers about his adaptation of the Peony Lantern story. Secondly, examining the narrative structure of his adaptation to confirm whether Kjordan actually fulfilled this promise. And thirdly, dissecting Kjordan's use of multimedia sources to provide a complete uh, peony lantern experience. I conclude by proposing a new concept, that of multi-adaptation, which I developed in response to the diversity of findings from this case study, and which I hope will fill a lacuna in contemporary theory providing food for thought to scholars working in early modern Japanese literature, as well as further afield. While the textual history of the Peony Lantern in a Japanese literary context has benefited from sustained academic engagement, this has tended to focus on literary products of the 17th, 18th and late 19th century. The pioneering study of the genealogy of the Peony Lantern as a story remains Tachikawa Kiyoshi's monograph although he gives surprisingly short shrift to Kyoden's Gorkan. More recently, we have Xiao Han Chen's essay on adaptations of the Peony Lantern in early 19th century Japan, which attempts to fill in some of the gaps of Tachikawa's account, although her primary focus does not move much beyond a comparison with the Ming Dynasty source text. Without wishing to forget Suzuki Juzo's excellent commentary in the Santo Kyoden Zenshu, or Sato Yukiko's brief contextualization of Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro in her unparalleled biography of the author, there nevertheless remain several unanswered questions relating to Kyoden's methods, motivations, and mastery of the strategies of adaptation at the heart of this Gorkan. I attribute this to the implementation, knowingly or not, of a so-called Shutenlon methodology. While this has resulted in the rigorous identification of Kabuki no Hana's sources, there's little room for considering the consequences of these carefully constructed intertextual bridges. In order to do so, I draw on the recent work of theoreticians working in adaptation studies. 
My guiding star in this respect is Linda Hutchins' A Theory of Adaptation, lately with additions on digital media by Siobhan Flynn. Hutchins' maxim that adaptation is repetition without replication, together with her emphasis on the role of creativity, the need for audience recognition of adaptation status, and the importance of extended engagement with sources, has made her work an essential companion in analyzing this case study. Indeed, drawing on this body of knowledge has enabled me to move beyond the limitations of only considering what was adapted, to also encompass the essential and pertinent issues of why, how, and for whom Santa Cure then embarked on this complex multimodal transformation. To begin with, I'd like to show you the lavishly illustrated front cover of Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro. Two things immediately stand out, and both serve to illustrate the title itself. Kabuki no Hana denotes a successful kabuki play. In British English, you can maintain the pun by translating this as something like blooming star of the stage. And lo and behold, the two figures in the central circle are indeed graced with the faces of noted kabuki actors Onoe Eizaburo I and Segawa Doko IV, both of whom appeared in the original production the previous summer of 1809 of a hit kabuki play written by star playwright Surya Namboku IV, Okuni Gozen Kesho no Sugatai. Needless to say, the play included an entire act in its first bun based on the Peony Lantern, and it's not difficult to imagine that Kyoden was appealing to the very audience that had enjoyed their performances. Secondly, one can see a rough sketch of a picture book with the title Otogi Boko scribbled out. This was the translation or softening into Japanese by Asai Ryoi in 1666 of the Ming Dynasty source text, Jianding Xinhua or Sento Xinhua. Although Kyoden has updated the 17th century format to look more like a kusazoshi, the style of clothing is much closer to the Genroku period or earlier, indicating that this is a story with some provenance. Indeed, Kyoden and his publisher made sure that the prospective reader knew when they uh, knew this information when they included it in the very end of that year's publishing advertisements. So a second potential readership were those attracted to the idea of a retelling of the illustrious Peony Lantern story, familiar from the previous version or intrigued by its historical pedigree. Kyoden himself elaborates on this information in his preface, where he presents his own literary genealogy shown on screen. In addition to Kuyu's source text and Asai Dioi's translation, you'll also note uh, Kyoden's own Yomihon from the beginning of the previous year, 1809, known as Ukibo Tanzenden. This was closely followed in the summer by the aforementioned Kabuki play and then Kyoden's own Gokan in 1810. For me, the most interesting phrase in this preface is Kyoden's promise to relight the Peony Lantern. And I think it can be interpreted in two main ways. First of all, we know from Kyoden's own admission at the end of Ukibo Tanzenden, together with Kyokute Bakin's later 1834 account in Kinsei Mononohon Edosak Shaburi, the Kyoden imperiled the success of his Yomihon by being very late with his drafts and ultimately bankrupted the publisher by insisting on an expensive Tang Dynasty book design. In this sense, then, Kyoden is using Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro as a second chance for himself to tell the story of the Peony Lantern. The other sense of this promise is his desire to capitalize on the success of the Kabuki play the previous summer. We know from his correspondence that Kyoden actually attended the performance and was highly impressed by the positive reaction of the audience, enough to want to produce a gorkan that would capture their imagination. The cumulative effect of all these paratextual elements, that is to say, the title, the front cover, the advertisements, and the preface, is to present a promise to tell afresh the story of the Peony Lantern. I would argue that this paratextual promise was calibrated to appeal to as wide a uh, readership as possible from theatrical connoisseurs to well-read fans, all the way through to those who had just heard of the Peony Lantern or whose interest was piqued by the eye-catching design and copy. The question is, did Kyoden fulfill this promise? The answer to this question comes in three parts, such that Kyoden frustrates the reasonable expectations of his readers. Then he manages to fulfill them before, finally, I would argue, exceeding them. In the first instance, Kyoden walks a careful line with his readers, because it turns out that the Peony Lantern was not in fact the subject of the entire book. Although it is suffused with peonies and peony lantern symbols within the story and the design itself. No, 
the episode comes only as the second half of the main story, some 20 pages into a 30 page project. Kjordan leaves several messages for the reader in order to reassure them, which would suggest that he was himself highly conscious of how the book structure conflicted with what he had initially promised. This message that you can see on screen delineated from the end of his introduction and presented in slightly larger characters establishes that the Gorkan is following the narrative design of the Kabuki play, with the Hotan, or introduction, followed by two main acts, or ban. Now, one of the points I'm currently working to clarify in my research is the exact sense in which Kjordan meant shukor. Following David Atherton's analysis of Kjordan's list of authorial ingredients in the 1804 Kibyoshi, Saksha Taino Totsuki Nozu, a useful approximation of this complex structural principle would be innovation. In other words, an idea which is introduced in order to generate a new kind of story. For readers in the late Edo period accustomed to novelty, this was essential, and Kjordan clearly understood the need to signpost his intentions. When it finally comes to the Peony Lantern episode, Kjordan takes his innovative shakur down an interesting narrative path. In comparison to the complex first part, he zeroes in on three primary characters, all of whom had previously appeared across multiple literary works. We have Kajizo, who is in hiding as Ono no Yorikaze, biding his time to exact revenge on the rebellious Tenji Kutokube, who swapped him as an infant and has just assassinated his real father, Kohagi Ujimura. Meanwhile, Tokube is on the run, as well, under the alias of Yatsurugi Hyoe, disguised as an ascetic. His master plan is to kidnap the maiden, Omi Naishi, and coerce her father into supporting his overthrow of the Ashikaga shogunate. She, meanwhile, has pledged her support to Kajizo and the restoration of his family, bringing us full circle. Actually, it's a triangle, but anyway. Moreover, although one might expect Pure then to have drawn on one particular version of the Peony Lantern, perhaps one of those listed in the introduction, or just to have re rewritten his own Yomihon from the previous summer. In fact, Kyoden, in a sense, draws on all of the previous versions. This table of working shows that each of the versions cited by Kyoden has its own context and radically different endpoint. From this, I've extracted the elements that they all have in common. And Kyoden definitely uses these essential narrative nodes as a kind of skeleton for the story, if you'll pardon the pun as a way of constructing his Peony Lantern episode. One of the ideas that I'd like to develop further in my thesis is that of a textual network with many roots to the same point, so that one could have appreciated the fundamental components of Kjordan's version, regardless of which version or versions you had experienced previously. Perhaps it would even have been enough to have a rough synopsis of the plot. The truest indication of Kjordan's narrative mastery is that he affects a transformation on each of these nodes so that the reader is delighted, thrilled, and challenged at every turn. To give a few brief examples, here Kjordan introduces for the first time the origins of the Peony Lantern itself as having been made by the protagonist, Ononoyorikaze. He also reconfigures the initial meeting of Ononoyorikaze and Ominaishi as the reuniting of old friends rather than complete strangers. His master trick, however, is the introduction of Yatsurugi Hyoi as an antagonist. The reader is encouraged both visually and in the narrative itself to follow Yatsurugi Hyoi, and from his perspective, it looks, as in all the other versions of the story, as though the protagonist is being seduced by a ghost with deadly intentions. Indeed, at the beginning of this chapter, he's heard word of Ominaishi's premature death, and like the reader, he is led to doubt what he sees in front of him. Even though Yatsurugi Hyoe shines a magic mirror and reveals the true form of Ominaishi, it turns out it was all an illusion caused by toad magic, a ruse to get Yatsurugi Hyoe to reveal himself so that he can be captured and brought to justice. As befits the conventions of Kusazoshi, Ominaishi turns out to be alive and duly marries Onono Yorikaze. Even the peony lantern itself turns from a sinister totem into a symbol of good fortune at the center of their wedding spread. In many ways, this convoluted but ultimately heartening story was exactly what readers of Gorkan would have cherished. But I believe that the sophistication of Kjordan's strategies of adaptation, constructing on top of this basic narrative skeleton, his own thrilling and unexpected version of the peony lantern story, 
would have surpassed even the wildest expectations of a whole range of readers. A detailed narratological analysis, however, does no justice to the materiality of Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro and its multimodal sophistication, integrating carefully calibrated images with streams of written text. As a matter of fact, Kyoden managed to include visual quotations relating to each and every one of the sources he mentions in his prefaces potted genealogy. I'll run through some representative examples so that you have a sense of the range of intertextual connections. No sooner have you opened the first volume and turned to the very first page, you're confronted with a large block of eight columns of 15 kanji each. In a manner of speaking, Kyoden has copied and pasted the opening section of the Peony Lantern from the Ming Dynasty source text, Sento Shinwa. Although he's added kunten reading marks, without any furigana, let alone notes, one is essentially dealing with hardcore kanban. It seems unlikely that the average reader of Gorkan, which are predominantly written in kana, with only a few common kanji thrown into the mix, would have had sufficient knowledge to decode this passage on their own. And in any case, it actually finishes on a complete cliffhanger. While some adept readers could certainly have made their way through the excerpt, I think it's meant primarily to be seen rather than read. Relating most strongly to Kyoden's scholarly activities is Koshaw, or antiquarianism, which increasingly came to the fore in his later literary output. This is especially apparent as Kyoden included an advert for his book project, Kotoshu, um, a little premature perhaps given that the first part was eventually released several years later in 1814. As such, though, this introductory passage of literary Chinese or Sinitic is really a demonstration to the reader of his extensive knowledge and the careful research that went into preparing this two volume book. The second example speaks to Kyoda's recognition of an attention grabbing image. Had I been more candid earlier in my presentation, I would have pointed out that the design of the sketched out picture book on the front cover is in fact closely based on one of the illustrations in the actual Otogi Boko the pivotal moonlit encounter between protagonist and femme fatale. Kyodan goes one step further in providing a full-scale renovation of the image as part of the Peony Lantern episode in the second volume, making this an intratextual connection as well as an intertextual one. While Kyodan has maintained the overall composition, he's taken the liberty of updating the fashion and hairstyles of the figures. The fact that the characters are wearing winter clothes in the height of summer is excused in a note to the reader on the grounds that it looked better all of which would suggest that Kyodan placed a premium on visual panache, while also wanting to root his own Mihiraki in Asaidoi's 17th century version of the Peony Lantern, perhaps as a way of rewarding those readers who recognized it themselves. Kyodan even managed to recycle material from his own Yomihon. The piece de resistance in the third chapter of Bukiboten Zenden is two consecutive Mihiraki, which use the page turn to present the revelation of the ghastly party populated with skeletons in a dilapidated house. It would seem that Kyodan was sufficiently pleased with the composition to combine elements of the two spreads in Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro, surely because of the strong diagonal design which encourages the viewer to follow the line of sight over the shoulder of the voyeur and into the central scene. We can glimpse an additional reason for the first spread's inclusion in yet another advert, this time for Uki Botan Zenden. Although we understand in retrospect that the Yomihan was a flop, I interpret this as Kyoden's commercial instinct to drive up sales by redirecting readers who were also, let's remember, customers to his previous publication. It also speaks to what Robert Stamm and Jorgen Brun have described as the dialogic relationship between adaptations and their source texts. That is to say, while the textual motion of a rewriting may suggest a forward chronological path, for the reader, the direction of travel may also lie in the opposite direction. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, Kabuki no Hana Botan Toro makes extensive use of theatrical ephemera relating to the production of Okunigoza and Kishō no Sugatami the previous summer. First and foremost, the scene included in the roundel on the front cover is drawn directly from the Tsujibanske advertisement with a couple of minor twists, and again renovated itself in the main story. To boot, Kyodan also draws heavily on the series of Nishikei prints by Utagawa Toyokuni I in his representation of Yatsurugi Hyoi from his get up as an aesthetic, all the way through to the entire double page sped of Yatsurugi Hyoi shining a magic mirror at Ominaishi. Given Kyodo's rhetoric in the preface, it would stand to reason that he decided to adapt these theatrical materials directly into his Gorkan in order to appeal to the audience who had already visited the production the previous summer. 
Another possibility presents itself in accordance with Sato Yukiko's observation that Gorkan likely functioned as substitutes for those unable to see the performances in person, perhaps women and children. Either way, here we're dealing with an extension of the theatrical experience, one which expands and develops on the page, the story that it appeared on stage, taking it down parallel paths and along other directions. Most tellingly, as Suzuki Juzo has indicated, some of the Nigawe in the Peony Lantern section belong to actors who had no connection whatsoever to the real production, which suggests that part of the attraction of integrating these materials was also to supply fans with new scenarios combining all of their favorite elements and actors. The fact that I've identified a visual source for all but one of the seven images in the Peony Lantern episode goes to show that Kabuki no Hana Botandoro is just as easily defined by what D. Max Merman has termed into visuality. Now, as I end the end, uh, near the end of my presentation, it's time for me to tie these different strands together and to offer considered position on Santo Kyoden's strategies of adaptation. One of the defining characteristics of Kubuki no Hana Botan Toro is its plethora of source texts and the way that Kyoden managed to integrate them all into a single graphic narrative. As I tie together my first chapter, I'm keen to determine whether one can apply the idea of naimaze or plot interweaving, originally a dram dramaturgical principle in Kabuki theater to account for Kyoden's integration of the peony lantern into his gorkan. For my preliminary investigations, however, I found that this mode of composition, even if it does fit, is limited to plot construction alone. How then to encompass all the interrelated visual and textual aspects of this multifaceted gorkan? Upon scouring the work of adaptation studies scholars, I discovered that the vast majority of case studies tend to deal with one-to-one -one adaptations. The closest lead I found is Linda Hutchins' brief mention of palimpsestuous intertextuality, although I don't think this does enough justice to the wealth of devices on display in Kabuki no Hanabo Tentoro. Instead, allow me to proffer my own contribution to help fill this gap in the theoretical landscape, multi-adaptation. My contention is that through this new concept, I'm able to accommodate the complete range of Kyodo's strategies of adaptation that were employed to fulfill his promise of relighting the Peony Lantern. Not only his amalgamation of plot elements common to all the previous versions and his incorporation of transfictional characters, which I've not had much time to touch on today, but also his multimodal integration of visual sources from each of these previous versions. I'd like to conclude by considering what lay behind this impulse to construct a multi-adaptation. It goes without saying that Kyoda was operating in the commercial publishing industry where success meant sales. And this was increasingly dependent on appealing to as wide a readership as possible. I would argue that this certainly lies at the foundation of Kyoda's efforts. I gestured earlier towards the idea of a textual network. The fact that one could access the Peony Lantern episode by one of any number of several possible intertextual routes. In many ways, this is the most significant consequence of multi-adaptation as a literary phenomenon. As a reader, one could have read just one of the source texts or seen just one of the visual references and you had a way in and a passage through the text. Kilden maximized the text's attractiveness, meaning there was a spectrum of ideal readers from curious bystander all the way through to connoisseur. This was all made possible by the broad capacity of Gorkham as a genre of graphic narrative in which a variety of multimodal sources could merge and ultimately flourish in a new context. Kjordan's desire to anticipate and satisfy the expectations of a, di a diverse readership speaks to his keen understanding of the competitive marketplace and late Edo period commercial publishing. I look forward to exploring how other writers used adaptation and the free movement of textual materials, just as Kjordan did to fuel the creativity and commerce embodied in popular literature across the 19th century in Japan. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your comments and questions uh, a little later on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Freddie, for that uh, fascinating and clear uh, presentation, which shows the, the benefits of applying uh, new approaches to uh, the source works. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so next, uh, as I said um, at the beginning um, of the session, we're going to have the Q&A at the end of the three uh, presentations. Uh, so we're going to regroup all those together. So uh, next today, uh, we have the great pleasure of welcoming 
Frank Chu of the University of Edinburgh, uh, who will present uh, the powers controlling the voice over the incomplete death uh, yurei throughout uh, Tokugawa, Japan. Um, so over to you, Frank Chu. Uh, hello, hi. Uh, I'll start to share the screen now, and you let me know if. Um, So is that happening? Um, I can't see any screen at the moment, no. Um, no. Yeah, um, my is always have learned a bit of problem on this. Uh, um, if you like, I can share the uh, one you sent earlier, if it's not working. Um, Sometimes leaving and rejoining can fix it. Okay. But do you want me to leave and rejoin now? Let's see. Try that, yeah. So we'll just wait a little while. I'm sure Frank will be with us soon. Oh, good, he's back with us. I'm back. He's back. Let's get some back. <laughs> I'll share screen. Uh, no, it's not coming. Is it saying anything in particular? Well, no. Oh. Uh, sorry. I can get someone in here to help. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to try sharing screen? Um, yes, I, I can share the screen if, if Frank will tell me next, uh, if you just tell me next when it's time to go to the next one. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, this, uh, yes, this happened one a couple of times before, so sometimes it happens, so it's, I was just in case. Okay, no problem. So I'll just uh, share, is that, can you see that now, Frank? Yes, yes, I can see that. Uh, amazing. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm a part-time student, a PhD student in the Edinburgh University. This is my around uh, second year as a full-time research, so it's probably in the in the middle of it. Uh, so my research is about the development of Kasane's ghost story in Tokugawa, Japan. So this seeks seeks to demonstrate uh, through a comparison of Buddhist and Confucian didactic sources. Uh, how Confucian ideologies present in later versions of the tales of Kazane reflected the general status of Confucianism at the level of local communities where Buddhist traditions operated in Tokugawa. Uh, Kazane, as she appears in these sources, was a village woman uh, murdered by her husband by the Kiku River. Uh, in the original version of the tale, following her death, the ghost of Kazane returned 16 years later and possessed the body of her husband's daughter, Kiku. She received salvation with the help of a Buddhist Pure Land school monk, Yuten Shonin. Uh, uh, sorry, not yet. Just uh, As the story grew in uh, popularity during the mid to late Tokugawa period, uh, it underwent uh, numerous alterations, including conversions into different art forms, such as kabuki, theater, yomihon, uh, and lakugo in early Meiji. 
uh, more importantly, as Liu 2016 emphasized in his dissertation on modern Japanese Yuli stories, uh, by the Tokugawa period, the different versions of Kasane's tales had already been broadly split into either Buddhist or Confucian didactic styles. Uh, choosing Kasane as a research object has its uh, little significance. Uh, like Raider 2000 categorized Tokugawa Kaitan, like the supernatural stories, uh, into two di distinct forms, the Buddhist didactic tales and the more recreative stories of Chinese novels, uh, as previous um, mentioned, like the Botan Dolo with, uh, was, uh, from the main Jiandeng Xinhua. Uh, so uh, Kasane's story belongs to the formal, apparently, but which represents a bit better the local environments of Tokugawa Japan. Uh, furthermore, by comparing these to the later Confucian deducted versions. So we begin to see a pattern of the development. Uh, next page, please. Thank you. Uh, my analysis of these uh, multiple and potentially conflicting versions of Kasane's tales is supported by a framework that breaks down the key components of each story into causation, manifestation, and the resolution uh, as a method to map out uh, narrative structures, particularly to the genre. Uh, to my knowledge, this analytical structure has not really been uh, proposed by any scholars of Japanese Yule. Uh, upon a through review of the salient literature, uh, two processes were revealed that the establishment of this analytical frame seeks to address. Uh, first, I began by revealing the works of well-known Japanese scholars who sought to define Yule. Uh, unable to summon ghosts for ins inspection, scholars were likely to draw upon archives in the making of credible definitions. Uh, consequently, there is a considerable overlap between the uh, ontological explanations of Yule and the uh, narratolo uh, uh, narratology of Yule's stories. Uh, so after reviewing uh, Yanagi Takunio, uh, uh, scholars like Komatsu Kazuhiko and uh, Suwa Haluo as definition of Yule, so I'm likely to use uh, uh, the Komatsu and Suwa's definition and combine them in the uh, construction of my own narratological framework. So secondly, by focusing on a sample of influential texts, I was able to map the development of Yuli's tales from medieval Japan to early Tokugawa. So there is an evidence of a gradual formation of a concrete causation manifestation and resolution structure in the Setsuba Yuli stories up until early Tokugawa. As her 2007 has already pointed out, this is uh, connected with the monopoly Buddhist temple held over the death rituals. Uh, while looking at the roles of various parties or characters and uh, uh, their performance at different stages of the causation manifestation and the resolution, I raise a question, who is capable of doing what uh, within uh, the setting of the story and its uh, greater context? For example, uh, when the Yule Kasane manifest, uh, manifests in that moment, what is she capable of doing in her capability as a ghost? So when the monk Yu Ten arrives to deal with Kasane, what is he in his role as a monk depicted as being able to do and how does this fit uh, with uh, what we know of the Pure Land Buddhist community of the time? Uh, next page, please. Uh, the original version of Kasane, the earliest one we can find is, uh, uh, is called Yule Jubots no Godo, collected in uh, Kokun Inu Chuomong Shu. Uh, it could be, that's, that's a very short story, but it could be uh, deconstructed into a number of critical elements. And each of these elements are 
common to a Buddhist didactic story collections uh, published around the same time. And for example, the most of the elements could be found in a Buddhist collection, Inga Monogatari, by Suzuki Shosan, uh, I think around 1660, uh, was published in uh, 1660. So in Inga Monogatari, the ghost stories already formed into a pretty clear causation manifestation resolution narrative structure if compared to much earlier Setsuwa collection like uh, the ghost stories uh, uh, in, for example, like in Kongjaku Monogatari Shu in Heian time. Uh, like in, uh, for example, like in the number one, number 22, the number 75, and perhaps there's a couple of more when they combine together, all the elements together, it becomes to the earliest uh, version of Kasane's tale. Uh, next page, please. Uh, as a few years later, six years later of the uh, original version of Yule Jubas no Godo, uh, a definitive uh, Buddhist didactic example of Kasane appeared. Uh, the name is Shile Gedatsu Monogatari Kikigaki. So when the story of Kikigaki is read in the context of the background of its author, readership, and publisher, alongside an analysis of its content, this entertaining ghost story transforms into a political propaganda uh, piece, uh, carefully crafted among, around the beginning of the 18th, uh, 18th century by the Pure Land Buddhist community. It differs from previous didactic short tales, such as those in the in Inga Monogatari, in that the Kikigaki does not just serve as an ideological propaganda. It also uses the action of the monk Yuten Shonin as a demonstration of strength and a lesson in what the Pure Land School is capable of. Uh, furthermore, in addition to excluding the practices of uh, rival schools from the very beginning and asserting the Pure Land name Butsu, uh, like the chanting Amida Butsu's name, as the only effective method of resolution, the Kikigaki also demonstrates that uh, like uh, the Pure Land monk can uh, what a pure land monk can go beyond conventional limits and use violence while solving problems. Uh, the pure land temple is also depicted as a provider of arms to poor villagers while also being influential enough to connect with local government officers. Uh, in Uten's dire, uh, didactic passage, the temple is also shown to uh, accept new followers without drafting them into a monastic life. Uh, villagers are, are granted access to the merits of becoming a monk while also being able to carry on living their ordinary lives in the local community. Uh, by relaxing the conditions of entry, but still maintaining their status as gatekeepers to salvation, the Pure Lands temples uh, monastic power is depicted as having an extensive and sustained reach into local communities. On the other hand, the local community is in uh, Kikigaki is depicted as being in a slightly weaker position uh, relative to that of the Buddhist temple. It organizes a name, the chanting Amitabha's name, but it was ineffective. Uh, the village had uh, attempted a didactic dialogue with the ghost by emphasizing a number of moral codes, uh, but it was unsuccessful. Uh, the community organizes funds to buy a small statue of Buddha, but resisted uh, the giving of alms to the, uh, the, the girl who was possessed by uh, Kazane Kiku. Uh, the local community does, however, demonstrated some power to uh, defend itself when the village had refused Kazane's request to sell Kiku's land, and also when the village as a whole proves capable of covering up their respective non-serious uh, yeah, crimes. Uh, 
uh, although a story which tells of the resolution of a troublesome Yuli, the Kikigaki also depicts a very confident Japanese Jodo Pyoland Buddhist community in the first century of the Tokugawa era. While in general, Buddhist monasteries were under the governments of the Tokugawa administrative system, uh, the, the Pure Land Buddhist monastery of the Kikigaki continues to play a solid role as a provider of order at a grassroots level of society. Undoubtedly, it promotes a number of moral codes in favor of Tokugawa regime, but it does so without ever being in conflict with its own interests. Uh, all, at no point in the story does there appear any sign that the Jodo Buddhist monastery was uh, concerned that its position in the community was being challenged by any, another, any other power. Uh, next page, please. Thank you. Uh, so in later Tokugawa time, there are later versions, uh, uh, similar versions of Kikigaki to be found. Uh, for example, Xinchuo Mengxu, published in 1749, is a, uh, it's a story, uh, it's very similar to the original one, Yule Jubots no Godo. Uh, it in, could be found in the chapter 13. Uh, in 1804, the Yuten Shonin Goitaiki uh, is quite similar to Shile Gedats Monogatari Kikigaki, it's a much longer version, uh, but it's with some small corrections during, uh, during the resolution stage. Uh, like So Maniki in 1817, it's also a similar to other versions. Uh, but also made some alterations at the uh, resolution stage. And uh, uh, Kinsei Kiseki uh, Kinse Ko in 1804 is by Sento Kyodan as well. So it contains uh, a detailed map of the area at the time. Uh, so this clustering of Buddhist versions of Kasane's tales during the Tokugawa period have uh, persisted enjoying considerable uh, longevity and popularity. Even with the advert uh, of a uh, divergent and more entertaining Confucian adaptions of Kasane's tale during the 18th century, so this re-emergence of Kikigaki and Yule Jubots no Godo edition in its entirely during the early 19th century demonstrates that the uh, older Buddhist didactic version never completely faded away. Uh, next stage, uh, sorry, next page, please. Thank you. Hmm. So in stark contrast to the story of Kikigaki uh, is a Confucian didactic version of Kasane's tale. For example, like the Date Kulabe uh, Okuni Kabuki. So in this version, the story focuses on why and how the main male character uh, kills two women in protection of the family he serves and to whom he is loyal. So the first woman the male protagonist kills becomes a Yule and takes possession of her sister, Kasane, who had become the wise man's wife. Uh, the possession transformed the sister of the slain woman into an ugly, hideous version of herself or to which she despires. Uh, she succumbs to a fit of uh, crazed jealousy and attempts to harm a lady belonging to the family of the local lord. The male protagonist eventually makes the decision to kill the crazed sister, his own wife, in order to protect the lady of the local lord. Uh, the role of the Buddhist monk is all but absent from this Kabuki version of Kasane's tale. The only mention appears during the attempted murder uh, whereby the lady's life is uh, miraculously saved by an amulet of Yuten Shonin, which appeared in the 
original Kikigaki version. So this section uh, also uh, implies that the murderer's uh, intent, intent of the sister who has clearly lost her mind is actually a manifestation of a Yule or more accurately in historical context, something close to a living ghost like a Ikilio. And of course, after the death of the wife, she too manifests as a, a Yule on, on the uh, Kinu River. So interestingly, there is no resolution or redemption for this ghost in the Kapuki version. So I can only assume that the uh, part of the reason was that the audience had uh, grown somewhat tired of watching Buddhist monks sending ghosts uh, to the Pure Land. Uh, next page, please. So there, there are also a few confusion deducted art forms of Kasane in late Tokugawa. And for example, uh, uh, the Shin Kasane Gedatsuko uh, Monogatari, which is a uh, Yomi Hong by Kyokute Baking in 1807. Kyokute Baking is a very pro Confucian uh, novelist at the time. And there's also one uh, revenge version by Sento Kyoto. I'm not sure how, uh, how much the, 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 the Confucian moral codes were promoted there yet. So I have not listed that one here. Uh, but uh, definitely in the early Meiji time, uh, uh, the famous Lakugo. Uh, Xin, uh, Xinke Kasane Gahuchi by San Yute Encho was, uh, uh, was, 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 was a quite typical one, but I haven't really uh, done much work uh, in that yet. Uh, uh, so next page, please. So at the current stage of my research, I have located most extant Buddhist versions of Kasane's tales from its first appearance in the uh, from the Kokung Inu Shu to the early Meiji versions, which all shares a great number of similarities. Besides the aforementioned Kabuki version of Kasane's tale, um, I'm still working on the Yomihon version by Kyokute Baking and the Lakugo version by Sanyute Encho. So my hypothesis is that at the moment is that the Buddhist and Confucian didactic style versions of Kasane's tale place emphasis on different uh, narratological sta stages of the Yule's genre. Uh, furthermore, Confucian values as they appear in, in the sources remain at an, as, remain at, at an ideological level in order to influence and explain the intention behind a character's behavior. However, in general, they are not shown to be effectively at dealing, effective at dealing with Yule, which might reflect a fact of the lack of local commun uh, Confucian organizations in Tokugawa, Japan. Uh, like it's a bit like different from uh, like the Ming society in China. Uh, so I, I think that's it. And the next page is the, some, some references I, I, I used. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. So it's still an early stage uh, research. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, for that uh, fascinating presentation, which shows the um, evolution and the very rich variety of the Kasane motif. So thank you for that. So um, we'd like, we've got about, uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, the initial plan was to take questions in chat, but I think um, uh, probably we can uh, ask people to raise their hands uh, and ask uh, questions to any of the speakers. Um, so uh, we'll take this opportunity for uh, anybody to raise their hands and, um, and ask a question about any of the presentations that we heard today. So any takers? Well, I have a question. <laughs> yes, Susan. Um, 
so this is directed towards um to, um to Freddie. Um I you you uh so um there seems to be a thread of the uh, Botandoro story that is um related to the Onono Yodikaze and Onikiki story. Hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Um did have you and this is just have you looked at the no version? Oh, I hadn't really. It's part of my <laughs> my work at the moment because in Ukiboten Zenden, Kyoden also integrates the characters into the the Peony Lantern section and uses it as a kind of a pivot in its own way. So, whereas the other versions all ended in, I guess, death and inside right. a coffin, and it's rather grim. I think he twisted in the Yomihon. And I'm guessing that this might well be based on no play, which I haven't checked yet, um, into a kind of eternal love story, and that they had all of these lives before, and even as temple cats. Um, but that's a lead that I haven't done yet. Is it pertinent? You think? Well, it's it's got to be. I mean, it's just one thread in this. You know, in it's just one thread. But um, there's a whole book on um, mm. on Ominameshi the no omineneshi, uh -huh. it's called um, the no omineneshi, a flower scene from many directions. Um, mm. Mace Bedhurst and Christina Laffin um, did it. And I've got a chapter in that on the no omineneshi. And there's uh -huh. also a chapter in my book on, um, that I just published a, a couple months ago okay. um, on, on omineneshi as well. Um, but uh, I'm not, there's, I'm not saying that there's a strong connection yeah. um, necessarily, but the fact that they're using the same names um, indicates that it's probably traced, can be traced back to those original stories, mm. which, you know, start as, um, uh, as, as uh, poetic commentaries um, on Kokinchu poems, and then uh -huh. turn into the no play in which the woman dies because uh, the man hasn't been true to her and then uh, it's a suicide okay um, so um anyway you you should just just a suggestion that you go back and look at that as well um very much like to probably some that. there's got to be a reason they're using the names <laughs> well it's, it's one of the interesting points is that um especially uh kajizo like for like two-thirds has that name and then suddenly of all the names that he decides to take when he goes into hiding, he uses like, what was he, like a hay and courtier or poet? Um, this kind of dramatic shift, which is I think a kind of stitching together of, I suppose the existing story or what's come so far. And then my sense was that there must be more to it than just uh, a sort of folk story. So if there is indeed a no play behind it and a kind of textual lineage there, I, I don't know. I wouldn't be too surprised if Kilden was playing with that and trying to leverage. I'm sure, I'm sure he was. And the play was very popular. Um, uh, even if it, it doesn't, it's not a completely coherent play, but um, <laughs> but it, but it's, and, and the stories behind it are probably the, um, the, the stories, which, which could, I could easily, you could easily, it basically is, a, it's, a, at its heart is a ghost play, obviously, all no plays are ghost plays, but um, the woman comes back and, um, and just, and accuses the man of, of having been, um, you know, untrue and causing her suicide, and he, they're both being, or he in particular is being tortured in hell, wow. um, by his, uh, but because he caused her suicide and then committed suicide himself. Um, anyway, just just something for you to look at. It's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That's a, a very interesting uh, question, and um, it's a reminder of how I think of how Tokugawa writers um, looked with great reverence to uh, medieval sources and. Um, and really uh, tried uh, integrated them uh, in, into their works. So uh, thank you for that. Um, are there any more questions uh, from any more uh, members of the audience? It would be great to have a, we've got some more time. So maybe a couple more questions would be great to have.
Um, I guess I have a question for you, Jonathan, if you don't mind. Okay. I was very interested in uh, this idea of having someone who's very noted as a as a playwright and then also having it seems a substantial body of poems, maybe e even if not all of them have survived. Was it, I don't know, forgive my ignorance, but was it common that sort of men of letters would be engaged in all those sorts of different directions? I mean, is, is it surprising to find the poems of Soske or Hmm. I th that's an interesting question, Freddie, and I think that um, it's it's actually surprisingly rare that a jewelry author ventured into another kind of genre. So, uh, for example, Sorsky was a Zen uh, monk, so I think that explains uh, why he basically had to <laughs> learn that as a kind of skill um, to to work his way up in the, in the temple system a little bit. Um, there's um, there were one or two jewelry authors who were uh, also writers of ukiyo-zoshi, but not particularly, not really greatly successful like Saikaku. Um, but there were uh, Nishizawa Ippu, for example, wrote in both genres. But then again, it's not really sure how much he put into the jewelry side of it, and whether he used um, his writing team to uh, to do a lot of the writing. And um, there's also examples of uh, authors who went the other way. So Saikaku, for example, wrote a couple of uh, Jordani plays, but they didn't have any particular great success. Um, that, but they weren't, they were not flops, but they, they didn't, they weren't really such, you know, great hits as one might imagine, uh, you know, uh, Saikaku to write a play. So um, I think that shows partly how being a dramatic writer, a uh, writer for the stage is so different uh, to, be a, uh, to being a writer for fiction, that maybe the pace is different, the dramatic effects are different and uh, that kind of thing. And uh, Sosuke, I haven't uh, had time to work on these yet, but Sosuke also wrote uh, linked verse, mm. uh, uh, so uh, this was obviously another way for him to um, to, uh, you know, make connections and enjoy time with the other people working in the theatre when he went, when he visited Edo uh, from Osaka, so he um, joined these Renga circles and take part. Um, so there is a little bit of interaction, but surprisingly, I think surprisingly little <laughs> would be my answer between the dramatic and non-dramatic worlds. But it's very interesting because in uh, your Gokan as well, I mean, it's mainly, uh, if I'm not maybe wrong, but it's mainly non-dramatic authors writing it, non-playwrights who write it, but they make a huge reference to Kabuki, don't they? And even your mention of Shuko, that was really interesting because that's, I think of that mainly as a theatre yeah. work that seems to have crossed the boundary over into the fiction, fictional genre. So um, it's a very interesting question, yes. Well, the question of Shuko is one that is, plaguing me at the moment in as much as I'm sure like many other um, graduate students I've made my way through Kasakuron but the extent to which I don't know Nakamura's thesis I'm not sure that I found him refer to Shukor being used in Gorkan specifically but I think in terms of other late Edo period art forms across poetry and theatre and I guess what we would call fiction um, and yeah, the extent to which it's like a, a universal, maybe, or at least he presents it as a kind of universal uh, principle. And yeah, I don't know how much it was just being used as a word and it had these different contexts and connotations or it was like the word, you know, as in like it had this particular connotation. Um, yeah, and I suppose it speaks a little bit too to what um, Sorsky was engaged with because if he's, if there's a kind of movement of themes or um, I suppose yeah, dramatic principles in one way or another from the poetry then I don't know maybe these these book boundaries were more porous than we like to think of um, I mean it's certainly nice to treat them as like separate genres or media or whatever but I don't know it's sometimes not entirely clear whether it was all a big mixing pot so to speak um, mm. yeah <laughs> I think in Sosuke's case, for, for me, this um, I, I presented it as a manifesto mm -hmm. of his uh, what he was going to do, but um, in a way, it was more like his own obsessions, which um, 
which sort of couldn't you couldn't help but write about. And I think for many you know writers, that's uh, that's a kind of thing where you know they can't help but write about a particular uh, thing. And um, so I think this is part of it. And also Shuko as well. Maybe the reason it's so generalized um, is that the theater audience and the readership of the Edo period were quite conservative mm. and they wouldn't really want something that was 100% new. They yeah. would want a, a story they already knew with something a little bit new, like a bit like fan fiction might do that today. Yes. So, uh, so this could be one reason for the surprising universality of, of, of the shukoi. So yes, yeah, an interesting question. Yeah. I have another question um, for Frank. Um, so it, 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 I really like the way that you um, are, are going way back into the, um, you know, the, the development of the Kasane um, as Yure. Um, and it seems to me like you're, you know, you're, from what I'm following in the, in the presentation, in, in, I'm, in, in terms of the resolution of the stories, obviously for Buddhist didactic stories, um, you, have to, you have to resolve the story by having Kasani be saved, otherwise it's not didactic, right? She has to go to the Pure Land or it has to be, or there has to be some kind of ritual resolution. And it sounded like what you were saying for the Confucian morality stories, the, the um, the ghost didn't necessarily need to be um, saved, that, that that no longer becomes uh, a, a main focus. Um, um, but it, it does seem to me like there are, for example, in Yotsia Kaidan, right, which is another the famous ghost story, it does seem like um, that there's a kind of Confucian revenge there where um, the, the ghost no longer gets released from their um, in the Buddhist thing, they, they realize that they've made this mistake and that they shouldn't be angry and that they should get released into enlightenment. But on the Confucian side, it seems like, or at least the Confucian influence side, um, they get re it's when they get revenge that they get released, right? It's the revenge itself, the righteous vendetta, revenge that releases them. But it sounds like in some of your stories, because the focus is on the male character rather than the the Yure character, they just drop her resolution completely. Is that what I understood? That it just they just aren't concerned with the resolution of the Yure. You're you're muted. <laughs> oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, oh. but yeah. Actually, for the, at least for the Kabuki version, I was looking. That was the, probably the early, uh, the earliest uh, uh, confusion we see the confusion part of the right. revelation of Kasane's uh, 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 art forms. Uh, it was a promotion of the Chugi, it's a loyalty to the, mm -hmm. that, that is the main uh, emphasis. And when when the woman was killed and it just appeared, the, the Yule kind of uh, appears and, and that's it. it, it didn't really, really, really look into that side, you know, it's just like, uh, uh, but that was a little part of when the, when the God crazed and the jealousy woman, uh, uh, his wife tried to kill the, the girl and she think her, uh, her husband has an affair about with, uh, literally the girl should be killed, right? <laughs> be hit by the, by, the, by the weapon, but it was the Yuten Shonin's amulet, you know, that's, that's protected as a miracle thing. So that's a part of, you know, still, you know, this is still the pure land that you can show in still, you know, is even the amulet can, can provide, uh, uh, maybe it refers to that, that woman has already become a lay or whatever. So that uh, has the effect. And that's just a little bit of it. Uh, and for the other, uh, like Kyoteku Baking Shinkas and Nego Monogatari is a big Yomihon actually. It's, it's a mm -hmm. very, very long uh, stories. They do have um, left uh, the space for the monks. Now eventually it will be the a monk coming 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 up and tell everyone uh Zambu Mujodis is uh, all and you shouldn't really hate hatred and all the uh ghost uh, appearances from the 
uh, the people who, who did the bad from the heart of the people who, who, who did committed the, the crimes. But actually all those uh, poor women, they were still alive and they just became uh, known in the chanting Buddha's name already. And then eventually they all appeared and had a kind of happy ending. You know, the, that sort of thing. Like, yeah, yeah, they, they the, the at, at least at the moment, my finding is, you know, the conf it's quite different. Actually, when I look at, at some early uh, writings of the Kaitan, for example, as Kaitan Senshu by Hayashi Lasan. Hayashi Lasan is a Confucian scholar. He's a quite a political person. And he was attacking Buddhism a lot, harshly, in, in his recreation of uh, Kaitan Senshu in early Tokugawa, because the Kaitan Senshu was written for a general, for the third, third generation general, Tokugawa forgotten his name, I'm sorry. But uh, in the popular level, in the later Tokugawa, it appears that, you know, this con some the Confucian uh, social the moral codes has found its place. It doesn't, it has left the, uh, it has left the, the space for the, the territory for the, uh, for the Buddhist community. So like the dealing with the Yule or some sort of thing. So it's a, it's always a space even within um, these Confucian morality tales for a Buddhist resolution, mm -hmm. because it must have been for the audience um, that if the the ghost isn't if there is no resolution, for it, it has to feel that has to feel um, like something hasn't been taken care of, right? No, I'm sorry, I didn't get that question. Mm -hmm. I'm I think I'm just agreeing with you. <laughs> <All right>. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but 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 mainly it sounds like even within the Confucian morality tales, mm -hmm. the um, there's a, a desire on the part of the audience mm -hmm. to resolve the ghost story. And so if your if your author is not anti intensely antagonistic towards Buddhism, yeah, it yeah. allows that it will allow that ritual back in and have it be successful. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, with the um part of the thing that happens in Kabuki and then comes on into modern horror is that the failure of rituals um becomes a part of the story because that allows the surprise that allows the twist. If the if the ritual fails, then there's a twist um that is surprising or makes the story different or new. Um so there's also that that narratological or narrative push towards mm -hmm. things not working the way they've always worked before, because then that makes the story more intrinsically interesting to the, to the audience because it's new. So there's lots of different things, I think, besides just Buddhism and, and Confucian that's working to push narrative, uh, your, the resolution of, of Yure in different directions, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, I want to look at Kikaki, the most, uh, uh, you know, strongest Buddhist deductive thing, and the Buddhist numbers didn't work. Actually, eventually, it was Yu Ten Shoni using some force power, you know, just to, if you don't really behave, I'll kill you, or something like that, and dragging the hair in a very violent way, and to to make the Yule to, to, to chant the Buddha's name. So there's always this little it's already happened at the earliest the Buddhist version. Thanks. Thank you very much. These are so interesting. I'm so glad we got to do this. <laughs> Even though it's now almost three o'clock in the morning, my turn. <laughs> well, we're staying up. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Susan and Frank. It was a very interesting uh, discussion to, to hear as well. Um, so I think we're kind of running out of time uh, now and the next uh, session has started. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, very much, uh, our speakers, um, Frank and Freddie, uh, Susan, also for the kind advice uh, and uh, IT, Easy on IT uh, support as well. So thank you for everybody, to everybody for the help with the session. So we'll finish this session there. So see you soon, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Izzy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.